Online. Great, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Again, my name is Corey Figgy. We're close, um, but that's okay. I get it up the time. Um, and I work over at the University of Maryland. Um, I've been there for 20 years now, or almost 20 years. And I started, um, I'm a spectroscopist by training, and I started with the deep impact mission. Um, getting involved with comets and the, the PI, the um, the uh, Mike Hearn, the PI was at University of Maryland and hired me as a postdoc. And so I jumped right onto that mission. I followed along with that extended mission. Um, so studying comets was really my my beginning at, for my formal career. And then I was on the Rosetta mission that was shared between uh, Europe and, and NASA. Um, and now I'm studying a lot of comets and other small bodies from the ground because we don't have any cometary missions in the sky right now. Uh, but I collaborate with uh, with other uh, colleagues and we have WST data, we have HST data on centaurs, on comets, on asteroids, on uh, the moon, looking at lunar hydration. So I'm I'm dabbling in all of the small bodies that I'm going to be talking about today in my presentation as well as some uh, things with the moon. So I will go on from here. Okay, so just to give you some basic overview of, you know, when I got into my career and, and why a solar system, folks studied the solar system instead of galaxies and black holes and some of the really fantastic um, other advances in, in astronomy and astrophysics today is because the solar system really gets to the heart of uh, where we come from as the human race. Uh, where we are going, and are we alone? And small bodies are particularly important because they don't necessarily tell us where we are going, but where we come from and are we alone, they can actually help answer those questions or at least shed some light on those. <laughs> and how do they do that? Well, small bodies are the oldest bodies in the solar system, right? They're sort of the fragments of the pre-planetary um, realm. So they were the, the leftover fragments as the uh, planetary accretion disk was, was forming. And so as the cores of the planets are forming, there's lots of little dust particles and ice particles. They are accreting onto each other, uh, gaining speed and gravitational wells and building into larger planets. But there's a lot of that material still left over in the solar system. And those uh, materials contain clues from formation, right? They, they have ingrained in them the temperature of that formation, sort of where they were during the formation based on the, the temperature of the materials there, the ices that were originally there in that protoplanetary disk. Where looking at the planet Earth, you can't really tell because Earth has gone through so much geological activity and progression since uh, four and a half billion years ago that the, it's not a pristine area anymore, right? So you can't study that original formational material. Um, so the small bodies that I'm gonna talk about are not only asteroids and comets, the things that we hear most often about, but also centaurs, uh, which are sort of a transitional body between the Kuiper Belt and Trans-Neptunian objects out in the colder realms of the solar system that then come under uh, Jupiter's influence and turn into the short periodic comets. Um, the trans-Neptunian objects like Pluto and the, the dwarf planets out beyond uh, Pluto, and interplanetary dust as well. Um, so many, like I said, many of these small bodies um, are actually preserved in the outer solar system in the colder realms, and they uh, don't have very, they aren't differentiated, and they aren't very altered, so those materials are still very pristine in the scientific sense. Um, although the asteroid belt does have things as large as like Ceres and Vesta, for example, and Ceres, of course, is, is very rounded. It's uh, differentiated. We think maybe Psyche, uh, which has a mission going to it right now by the same name, um, might also be the core of a larger um, asteroidal body, which had been differentiated and, and we're potentially going to be able to see the iron core, or the bare core of that after some impact from a long time ago. So even the small bodies, which sort of preserve these original clues from our formation um, and of the solar system can still be altered or differentiated, uh, but there's plenty of things out there that still contain some of the building block material of the planet. So in addition to kind of learning about ourselves um, and you know the fact that these are the building blocks of the planet, 
as you can see from this picture on the left here, uh, the Earth and many of the other planets have actually been impacted by these types of bodies, right? So we have lots of craters. We have a crater record on the Earth. There's a crater record on the, Mar on, um, the Moon and on Mars and on all of the, um, on the surface bodies, terrestrial bodies that we can see. And so we know that things hit them. It's a combination of, of comets and asteroids. But as these, uh, as these bodies hit the Earth, right, they bring the dusts and the ices and the organics from that accretionary period to the Earth. So there's a big question of, is the water that we have here on Earth now actually delivered from asteroids and comets? Um, are the organics that then went in, you know, the amino acids and such that have uh, started life, were those ingredients actually delivered by comets? Or did they form with the Earth originally um, as the Earth was accreting? So we get all of this type of information from the small bodies, which makes them quite exciting, uh, quite exciting to study. In addition to the fact, like I said, we have a, a cratering record our, ourselves here on Earth, and there's always that potential um, for a future impact. So knowing them, in addition to the scientific study and the, the joy of discovery, um, the planetary protection um, comes up as well. And to get at where if, if uh, Earth's water, for example, has come from one of these small bodies or these families of small bodies, if we measure... The, uh, the Earth's deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen, compared to the hydrogen, and you can measure that in, in water. So Earth's ocean waters, the um, standard mean ocean water deuterium to hydrogen ratio is right here at the, at the zero level in this particular plot, the way it's normalized. The moon has somewhere in the range above and, and below the Earth, but basically falls on the same line. Mars, similarly, and the chondritic meteorites, the, the meteors uh, that make it to the ground, and, and we actually collect them and, and study the meteorites, those meteorites also fall in about that same range. When you look at the Oort cloud comets, which we have to do from a, a telescope, the Oort cloud comets are the ones that um, come in maybe once um, in their lifetime, uh, after being perturbed by a, a nearby stellar approach or something. Uh, those Oort cloud comets that we have studied have a higher D to H ratio than the Earth. Uh, but the Jupiter family comets, the ones that are on the short period uh, orbits that are really under the influence of Jupiter's gravity and take five to 10, five to 20 years to orbit, some of those comets are closer to what we find on the Earth um, whereas some of them, like the one from, from the Rosetta mission, Comet 67P, Churyu Moskarasimenko, which is at the very top of this plot on the right-hand side, um, that comet is much higher than even the Oort cloud comets. So comets really fill the realm of D to H ratios, um, but they could overlap with the Earth. Um, as I said, the meteorites, which come from uh, asteroids mainly, but also comets, right? It's, it's all this material um, that, that matches the Earth's water. So to make the DDH ratio in water, to make the DDH ratio in, you can make it in, in methane, um, anything that has hydrogen in it that you can study the deuterium um, isotope, then you can get this DDH measure. Okay, so small bodies with their orbits and their snow lines, which ones are actually going to preserve some of these ices so that we can study them? The small bodies that I had mentioned before, the asteroids, the comets, the centaurs, et cetera, those are mainly in, in the um, from you know in the planetary region, right? So the comets can come in from a, a distant Oort cloud, come into the sun for perihelion, and go back out. The Jupiter family comets stay between Jupiter and the sun. The centaurs are these transitional bodies between the two. The asteroid belt, as I'm sure all of you know, is between Mars and Jupiter. Um, so all these bodies are, are fairly close uh, to the sun you know, the asteroids, the comets, and the um, and the centaurs. But then the, the Kuiper Belt objects and the trans-Neptunian objects, um, and as I said, the, the comets that still reside in the Oort cloud before they've been perturbed and come into the sun are much further out. So they are more likely to preserve some of these ices, right, the higher volatility ices, whereas the materials that are closer to the sun, especially if they were formed closer to the sun, are probably not going to retain as many of those high volatile, um, high volatility ices. And to give you a little temperature chart here, um, when we talk about volatiles, 
on these bodies. Water, we're talking water, we're talking carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, ethane, methanol. Those are the types of carbon-based um, organics. And then the three major the three major volatiles of water, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide that we generally share or that we generally see on, uh, on comets themselves. The uh, sublimation temperature for water is 160 degrees. So put that in the distance from the sun, you're at about 3 AU. So you're in the asteroid belt and you can still preserve water. But in the inner asteroid belt, you're going to uh, remove a lot of that water because it's going to sublime right from the ice stage uh, to the gaseous stage, find its way out of the of the asteroid, finding you know some porous route outside of the asteroid, and then become uh, the gas and and move away from from the asteroid. The methanol, for example, has a sublimation temperature right around 100 Kelvin, and so you have to be out between Jupiter and Saturn out at 8 AU uh, for the methanol essentially to boil off. Carbon dioxide, you get a little bit further, a little beyond Saturn. And then when you get into formaldehyde and the carbon monoxide, you get much further out into the solar system. So really the brand new comets that we see come in for the very first time around the sun. Um, and these Kuiper Belt objects that, for example, the New Horizons mission uh, visited in the case of Arakoth, um, those bodies might be easier. Um, they might hold on to some of these materials more readily. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you guys about activity on these small bodies. What produces the activity, how we study the activity, um, and you know what, what gets me excited every day to go into work and, and what I do. So small bodies, uh, when they get close to the sun or even in their orbit, even if it only changes by, by a few um, AU for, for an orbit or, you know, partial AU for an orbit like an asteroid belt. Um, the asteroid itself is not going to change very much, but it still has a perihelion and an aphelion, closest point and furthest point from the sun. Um, these small bodies shed material. They shed material and it manifests in things like a diff diffuse comb or atmosphere, a tail, or even a trail across its entire orbit. And we can see these things. These are observational effects that we can see. Now, that uh, shedding of material can be due to numerous things. Um, it can be caused by an impact. For example, the DART mission that happened two years ago now, um, that was a collision experiment uh, on purpose, right, to see if we can deflect a, um, something that is, is potentially hazardous to the Earth. And so that was a particular impact, and all of the material that's coming off has been studied, and it's this dust uh, tail that's that's really left um, a, a trail that you can see in HST images even three to six months after after the impact. And so that would be something we would consider activity, right? It's not a point source of light anymore. Now it has a, a tail or a trail. Um, we also see an asteroid Sheila in, um, back in 2010. It was impacted by something in space, not something uh, homemade or handmade. It's not an engineering feat, but it was an actual <laughs> natural impact. And that caused um, this material to be shed from the surface, and it was captured in various telescopes. So, so material shedding and activity can be caused by impacts. It can be caused by breakup. And a lot of times the breakup is caused by some um, thermal wave or a thermal stresses. So, for example, Comet 73P Schwarzman Bachmann 3 broke up, and HST caught this picture in 2006. It was also imaged by Spitzer um, spacecraft and several other ground based and space based telescopes once it was, once it was known. Um, but it broke up into several different fragments. Each of those little fragments ended up having a coma because once something has fractured and ice that was inside has now seen the light of day and the warmth of the sun, it starts sublimating uh, because it might be the first time that it's ever been warm to these certain temperatures. And so you get, again, you get a tail, a trail, a coma um, from something like a breakup or a cliff collapse. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. When you have the uh, tail, you have the, the collisions that cause that material to eject like that, do you suddenly get more information about the, the composition? The interior, absolutely. Okay. Yes. And in fact, so you a lot of times you'll see one of these um, 
impacts, collisions, outbursts for, through observational methods, right? Whether you see a brightening or you all of a sudden see a coma or something that's not point, point source, point light anymore, right? Um, and we do a, a huge follow-up campaign oftentimes. And part of that follow-up is spectroscopy or some other narrow band filter where you can get more at the composition itself. Because yes, you a lot of times are exposing something brand new, either the thing that caused the outburst or the shedding or um, the material that has been on Earth that has not been weathered, has not been out in space for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so another thing is volatile sublimation. And volatile sublimation is just what I was talking about on the previous slide, the water, the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, that type of thing. Um, these volatiles that are feeling the warmth of the sun and for the first time, whether the thermal wave is reaching them on the surface or the thermal wave is reaching them below the surface as it, as it propagates through the body, the small body, because a lot of these things are irregularly shaped or rotate in certain ways where they actually have seasons. And so the temperature wave is a little bit different for every single body. Every single one we see is just slightly different. Um, and so that ambient sublimation is often cyclic. And we can see it in, in comets and we can see it in um, things that we call main belt comets or main belt asteroids. And a lot of times because it's cyclic and dependent on that helio, um, that, that solar insulation, that heliocentric distance, uh, you, you can see this cycle in, you know, this pattern in your observations. Um, and a great example, this chart is called the Christmas tree by everybody in the, in the commentary world. Uh, this was for Hale-Bopp back in 1995 and 1996, as it was being observed, perihelion is right here in the middle, and all of these different colors of the, the Christmas tree, the slopes going up to the perihelion point here in the middle, was showing a specific gas as it's being observed uh, through various methods and how it's increasing with time until it gets to perihelion as it gets closer to the sun. Then as the comet re starts retreating from the sun, that material, that production rate gets a little bit slower because it's not continuing to be warmed as much, et cetera. And the sources turn off or they refreeze, they recondense whatever the, the uh, thing is, but the thermal wave doesn't propagate any further. And so you reach uh, the extent of your, of your reservoirs that are subsurface. And you generally have this, you know, this is what we thought we had a very nice symmetric uh, thing going on in a lot of comets. It turns on, it gets up to perihelion, and it, it starts turning off. Sometimes there's an ever so slight lag um, one way or the other around perihelion, but in general, you know, the, product, the productivity increases and the productivity decreases. Um, you can also have Outburst, and right here is an example of um, 67P, the, like I mentioned, the Rosetta target. And right here, the, these were taken in July of 2015 when the comet was coming into its uh, cometary summer. This uh, comet is a very unique shape, and the pole orientation was such that the northern hemisphere um, and the southern hemisphere see different seasons. So the southern hemisphere has um, perihelion, whereas the northern hemisphere is facing the sun when it's at aphelion. And so various parts of the comet have a very different thermal history um, and, and weathering. And right here is when the um, when we were basically passing through equinox and getting into the summer um, outbursting season, if you were, right, when the thermal uh, wave was propagating through the southern hemisphere of the comet, and we saw a lot of instantaneous outbursts like this. Some of the outbursts were contained with mostly dust. Some of them, uh, we feel like they were all probably driven by volatiles, but not all of them showed volatiles within uh, the spectra that we looked at. But they're very collimated. Um, a lot of times the collimation has to do with surface features right near where the gas is escaping from. So I already gave a hint because pretty much all I showed you just then were pictures. How do we detect the activity? Well, typically we detected originally uh, through imaging, uh, but we do follow up with spectroscopy. So the image, you know, the dead giveaway for something undergoing some, some new activity is a point like point light object that you've been studying for a while is no longer a point like, right? You, so you get some spatial information there. It's larger than the nearby stars um, as far as the point spread function or the four with half max as you're measuring it. Um, and it's brighter if you're maybe just taking a uh, spot photometry 
or aperture photometry and just reading out that type of information, something you've been looking at for a while, all of a sudden jumps an order of magnitude or is uh, increasingly getting brighter. And so that's when we know that activity is turning on on some of these small bodies. Here's an example from uh, the test spacecraft. And now the test spacecraft is out there looking for extrasolar planets. It is purposely looking and staring at different sectors of the sky um, and taking numerous scans of that sector all month long, and then it changes to another sector. And so we, um, even though it's staring at sectors of sky and looking for transiting planets with, you know, orbital periods of up to a month or so um, on, that, on that area of sky, it's serendipitously catching comets and other small bodies that go through its field of view. And in this particular case, um, in 2018, during this particular sector, they've captured four different asteroids, and you can see they're fairly point-like, right? That what you see here in these um, four to the right um, images from TESS are processed point spread functions, you know, of of these asteroids. They are point sources. The image on the left. Uh, that's labeled 2014 UN271 is Bernstein uh, Bernadelli, which is a comet that was discovered in uh, 2018. Anyway, uh, the number is 2014, so maybe it was discovered slightly earlier, but I can't remember. Sorry about that. Um, but anyway, it went through the test field of view for an entire month, and we have several images from it. I was... Um, <coughs> working with collaborator Tony Farnham on this particular paper that he first authored. And what you can see here is all of those other asteroids, all of those point spread functions are all of the colored diamonds along this track, right? They have a much less um, uh, full with half max of their point spread function, but the comet we know was active. Um, and that's because it followed those black dots, which it, uh, makes, you know, shows the full with half maximum is, is much larger for that particular comet. Um, almost double, not quite double. And so we said, okay, it's not a point-like function, which means it's active. The problem was Bernstein Bernadelli is way beyond the orbit of Saturn. In fact, its perihelion doesn't even come closer than the orbit of Saturn. So why was a comet that we that we had already discovered? How how do is that already active so far out into the into the solar system? So I will go to more on that in a minute, but that is one of the things. So these surveys that we have now that are all sky surveys are actually really useful for, um, for small body science because they are helping us get these high cadence observations, just being able to watch something that all of a sudden becomes a transient and right. That's what we're looking for a transient to show that outbursting um, or activity is starting. And then once we know this pretty quickly, um, we can turn on some spectroscopy follow-ups and we can detect the gases that were expelled from that particular um, point of activity. And here is a spectrum from the James Webb Telescope showing you uh, CO2 that is detected in one of the centaur objects, uh, 39 PO Terma, and showing a very nice um, detected signal of CO2. CO2 is one of the volatiles that we know is, is fairly um, common in comets. However, it's very hard to detect because we basically have an opaque uh, window uh, of, through the telluric, through the Earth's atmosphere um, at these wavelengths. And so we cannot detect CO2 from the, from the uh, ground. We have to detect it if we're detecting it directly without some sort of oxygen proxy or carbon proxy. Uh, we have to detect it from spacecraft like James Webb that are looking in the infrared that are above the Earth's atmosphere. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this Christmas tree diagram because, as I mentioned, we generally think of symmetric behavior about perihelion when we think of comets shedding their material and their activity turning on. And one thing to note on this particular plot, if you see the top two lines with their label as oh, wait, this is. Um, with the proxy of the hydroxyl um, um, molecule, and it's, it's a proxy for water because they weren't directly measuring H2O, but um, OH is the top one, and if you can see the green, it's the next line under that, and that's CO. Out at around 3, 4 AU, those two lines cross. 
they still both increase pre-perihelion and they both decrease post-perihelion, but they cross right around that water snow line. The water at that point is condensing out around 3 AU or it has not turned on. In this case, it's pre-perihelion. And so you see CO as actually the majority of the outgassing um, for, for Comet hill -Bop. But in fact, it is not more, it is not more abundant within the comet. It's about 20 to 30 percent of, of the gas in Comet hill -Bop is, right. is CO compared to water. In comparison, we do occasionally see comets that are not typical. As I mentioned, none of the comets seem to look the same. Um, they have their, they each have their own interesting uh, geography and topography, but some of them even have unique activity. And this particular comet, Comet Garad, C2009 uh, Q1 Garad, had water that reacted, or I mean, uh, water that um, acted this similar to a typical comet where perihelion is this dashed line right down the middle. <laughs> And it increased as it got to perihelion, and then it started decreasing in the amount of water that it was producing. But the CO, which was measured um, from several ground-based um, telescopes in Hawaii and down in Chile, and then measured by the deep impact um, spacecraft, you can see the carbon monoxide is measured, and it just keeps going. It never turns over until we get to the point where our uh, telescopes that we had available and looking at this comet uh, weren't sensitive enough to really go beyond this point. But at this point, the the amount of CO compared to the water measurement that was taken simultaneously was about 60%. So this particular comet, first of all, had a lot of CO compared to water, but in addition, the activity was not symmetric for CO around perihelion like it was for water and very different from what we saw with Hellbop and, and many other comets that we consider uh, typical cometary behavior. So as we're studying more and more of these small bodies and, and comets and, and we can see them spectrally, we can see them um, you know, visibly and we do lots of imaging and surveying, we're seeing there's a lot more to their behavior than just it turns on when it gets to perihelion and it turns off and it turns on within two or three AU and then it turns off. Uh, we're seeing things active much further away and their behavior is not what you would necessarily predict. We also have seen a few comets with unusual composition. So uh, this comet in 2016, C2016 are two pan stars, um, had a very unusual composition. It had mostly CO, and CO, if you recall from my temperature uh, plot or table that I showed in the first couple of slides, um, does, has a sublimation temperature down around 20 to 30 Kelvin. So that's out toward the Oort cloud distances, right? It, it's out beyond where Voyager is. It's um, out beyond definitely all of the planets. And if you have something as cold as CO, you also have the, um, the sublimation temperature of nitrogen. Um, so nitrogen and CO were both very high in this particular comet compared to what we see in, in the average comet where CO and CO2 are somewhere between the 5 to, to 20 percent. Um, the majority of, of the behavior of this comet, the majority of the gas that we were measuring were CO was very water depleted. And here in the, in the uh, visible or near ultraviolet and visible, is the nice band of nitrogen plus and two plus. So we can see the nitrogen um, in this particular comet. If a comet retains CO and N2, that means that it was formed and stored out in these further distances from the sun as compared to closer, like in the terrestrial planet area. Now we do realize that as things were forming, uh, there was a lot of mixing, right? The sun itself was was more active, um, had a lot of different radiation that we have now. There were solar winds. Um, and we know from the SARDA samples that came home from the, the coma of Built 2, Comet Built 2, there were high temperature um, silicates right next to lower temperature materials that would not have survived in such high temperatures. And so there, we know there's a lot of mixing. But in order to retain or even to have CO and N2 condensing on grains and being a part of this comet, we know that this, this comet both was formed and um, stayed out in the outer part of the solar system much longer than, 
and many other comments. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Hartley 2 because this is the comet that I have studied the most in my career. And Hartley 2 is what we call the prototype for the hyperactive comet. And what I mean by hyperactive comet is this grouping of comets here to the left on the plot, which if you look, the bottom here on the plot is the effective radius in kilometers. So they're very small. They're less than a kilometer or so in that, in that uh, regime of size. But yet their activity, their active fraction, is at 100% on this log scale on the y-axis. So these comets are acting as if their entire surface is sublimating. Well, if you've ever looked at any of the images that we've actually taken from spacecraft of comets, they don't have a lot of ice directly on their surface. So how in the world are these small comets that are Jupiter family comets that come in close to the sun every five years and heat, you know, and temperature regimes that are much warmer for water just to boil right off and sublimate, how are these things active over 100% of their area? Well, when we got there with the deep impact spacecraft, we found out the reason. The reason was the surface area was not actually coming from the comet. The surface area was coming from all of these tiny icy grains that were being expelled from the subsurface of the comet through all these little jets from larger jets at the ends of the comet. And this um, increased surface area from every single one of these grains is what bumped us up to about 100% activity. What's interesting about this comet, as we've studied it um, over that particular apparition in 2010 with the Deep Impact spacecraft, and then later, is that its activity is actually changing. And so um, spectroscopy-wise, uh, spectroscopically speaking, we could measure the typical carbon dioxide. We could measure water. It doesn't really have much CO. Um, the CO2 to water ratio is about 20% in this comet. So that yeah, puts it toward the higher range for, for most of our Jupiter family comets. We can also measure the ice. This ice for small grains. Those are the grains physically in, um, in the coma itself, not on the surface. When we integrate either the ice absorption bands that we can measure or the emission bands that we can measure for the different gases, we can create maps. And we created maps of the water, created maps of the CO2, and created maps of the water ice in addition to some other maps. But we can see none of these are directly correlated. The CO2 and the ice are most correlated, right? So the CO2 could be dragging out, as it sublimes, it could be dragging out water ice grains with it from the subsurface. Whereas this water vapor, seems to not be coming from those same areas. The water vapor seems to be coming off of the, what we call the neck of this particular comet, if you think of it um, as like the stripe around a, a bowling pin. And that's because what we think is, as I mentioned, the CO2 is dragging out ice. The ice, a lot of it is uh, sublimating as when it hits the coma and giving us uh, this extra water that causes it to be hyperactive. But then some of the ice, grains do not escape the gravity well, and they do actually fall back onto the comet. And they coat this smooth gravity low of uh, partly two, and then that releases a little bit more water sublimation. So water's yeah. coming from a couple of different places, but the active fraction that gets it over 100% are actually because of the ice grains. And here is just, I said it was sort of the prototype of hyperactivity. pictorially. of what might be going on. But as I mentioned, the activity of this particular comet is changing. 1991, we took measurements of water and the very top uh, point on this plot, which I cannot point to because I am too short, but I will do it for those folks um, online who can see what I'm sharing. This point, for example, is the highest water production rate we have for this comet from 1991 measurements um, from HST. And then the very next apparition in 1997 and 1908, this comet was measured with water production rates about a factor of three lower. By the time we got to the 2010 apparition of this comet, which was yet two apparitions later from 1997, 1998, and when the epoxy mission was, was there and measuring the comet, we reduced again by another factor of three. So almost over the course of 20 years or so, this comet has reduced its activity um, by about a factor of 10. And 
the measurement that called it hyperactive were these first couple of measurements. At this point, it's almost not hyperactive anymore. It wouldn't fall into that 100% activity any longer. And in fact, October 2023, so just uh, about six months ago, the comet came to yet another perihelion. And here are two measurements from a Lowell Observatory out in Arizona of the water pre-perihelion and the water post-perihelion. So it is. it seems like it's dropped yet again in the 2023 uh, time period. And so if this comet keeps reducing its water reservoir every single time it comes close to perihelion, eventually it's going to fall off to the point where we might not detect it, we not, might not be sensitive enough to measure its water, but also it is no longer hyperactive. So the question remains, what made it hyperactive to begin with? Are all comets hyperactive at some point, and then all of them sort of lose their volatiles to the point where they're no longer hyperactive? Um, and these are the kinds of questions that that keep us going in our field because we're we're trying to get to the to the bottom of that. Are there reservoirs in there that just never get tapped? Are there reservoirs that get uh, secluded based on some sort of rotation or season, and sometimes they turn on and sometimes they don't? when the comets burn out and become dormant comets. Uh, the next comet I want to briefly talk about is Comet 12P. You may have heard about this one in the news recently because it is the comet that could have been seen if you had perfect dark skies during to totality um, last Monday. This was the comet that is coming to perihelion next week at a distance of 0.78 AU from the sun, and it was between Jupiter and the sun um, like I said, it's during totality, if you could see it. This particular comet was discovered back in the 1800s, and it was discovered during an outburst. So this comet has been known to outbursts for a couple of centuries already. And it has very distinct patterns in some of its outbursts. And there's been many observations of the comet this particular year, not just because it's been outbursting very frequently and we've been able to see it, but because there's all of these uh, surveys that have been watching the sky a lot more uh, amateur astronomers and professional astronomers alike are capturing this comet and, and watching it develop as it's getting close to, to perihelion. Uh, we don't know the exact driving mechanism of all of these outbursts, but we do know that they are volatile controlled, or we presume that they are volatile controlled um, because there are measurements of several volatiles within their outbursts. And here's just a smattering of some of them that I grabbed from uh, various folks on comet mailing, comet observation mailing list. This was from Terry Lovejoy. The devil horn um, comet got its name from this particular observation from last July when it outburst. Here it is uh, right after it outburst uh, near an 8th magnitude star the night before. Uh, the the uh, person, Bob Gardner, who took this image, said it was two to three magnitudes less bright and tonight it was brighter that particular night it was brighter than that star in the field of view and here um you can see a pre-outburst image beautiful tails and and everything filaments coming off of, of the comma but if you look at the size of its coma and then compare it to the far right image the coma has almost doubled in um in radial size and that was back in uh, a couple weeks prior to the solar eclipse, had this particular outburst waited until the day of the eclipse or the night before the eclipse, it might have given us a bigger, brighter show uh, during the eclipse. And here is the light curve for that comet. Basic light curve photometry, you can see every single one of these spikes as it's coming in 200, I guess this one's 400 days pre-perihelion. All of these are several magnitude outbursts of this comet is undergoing. So this is a very active comet. It's a Halley-type comet. Like I said, it has a 71-year period. And so um, we, in our lifetime, most of the folks in, in this room and online, this is the time we get to see it. Um, so enjoy it while you can. Oops. OK. And a comet that comes around every 71 years leads me to comets that are even further away um, and still are displaying some sort of distant activity. This particular comet I mentioned earlier, Bernadelli um, the Bernstein, and this was the comet that I, that I showed you in the HS, um, the test um, imaging, where it's full with half max. When we looked at it, it was larger than all the Point Lake 
uh, asteroids that were serendipitously caught in that 30 day sector. It was discovered in 2021. Um, but we have pre recovery observations as distance as, as distance as 34 AU. And at 34 AU, um, it was a point like object. But as it started getting closer, it became um, non-point like with a with a coma and definite um, material being shed. So the diameter of this particular comet, because you can look at the point light observations and get a very nice measurement extrapolated out to about 130 kilometers if you make a few assumptions of the albedo, how bright um, the comet surface is, and most comets are, are fairly dark in the visible only four or five percent. And so um, this diameter measurement of 130 kilometers is one of the largest comets known, right? That would be bigger than Hillbop, that would be bigger than Comet Halley, fairly large comet. Um, and as far out as about 28 AU, it was exhibiting continuous activity, not just an outburst here or there, but continuous activity, a continuous coma. Um, and that's the one that comes not even as close as Saturn in 2031. However, we have very uh, powerful telescopes these days coming online in the near future um, that should be able to detect it in 2031, even at those distances. We also have comets like 2017 K2 Pan Stars, um, who experienced perihelion back in 2022 at 1.8 AU, but this comet um, had activity as far out as when Bernadelli um, Bernstein was um, observed and detected at 34 AU. It's not the first time this particular comet has been into the inner solar system, but you can see all these pre-covery images from the Catalina Sky Survey once they know where, where to look for it. And you can see, although back into 2015, there is still something um, being detected there. And here its comet is growing every year. Um, a scientist by the name of Dave Jewett took these coma images uh, and studied them with, with HST. And you can see the coma very nicely growing and the distance as it's getting closer and closer to the sun uh, decreasing here, coma forming. <laughs> very active all the way out beyond 15, 16 AU. So what is causing this particular activity? This one we were, it was bright enough and we were able to point um, HST toward it. And we saw that um, we also had ground-based telescopes pointed to it and we could, we did not detect any uh, CO2, but we could detect CO. James Webb was not, um, had not been launched yet. And so we could not do CO2 from the ground because of the, the um, opaque atmosphere, but we could measure the CO, and we did measure it right here with uh, some radio telescopes down in, in Chile and in Hawaii, um, and we could also measure the ice. And there is water ice being drug out, we assume by a similar method as the uh, hyperactive partly two, and it's being driven out by CO, which is being, which is being measured here. Because beyond 13 AU, where we see the activity, that would be even too cold for CO2. It's beyond the CO2 water line, so it must be the CO that's dragging out the, the water ice. So for all these future distant active comets and active centaurs and active Kuiper Belt objects and dwarf planets, in order to see them, here's a timeline uh, on the bottom here with year, we're, we're a little beyond 2020, the the um, data were collected up until about 2018, 2019, and heliocentric distance on your y-axis. And you see most of the comets that we know, whether they're from the Pan Stars Survey or Catalina Sky Survey, all of these um, comets that have shown activity at fairly large distances, really we never breached right 10 to 15 AU because we weren't that sensitive. When we started being able to detect the comets like K2, um, both uh, inactivity and the pre-covery images. Um, if we put Bernstein Bernadelli, oops, wrong direction on here, it would be off the charts, literally, up there on the top. And so it's really going to take um, observations with JWST and other, you know, like I said, coming online uh, surveys that go deeper in order to see some of these, some of these things with activity, especially if we then start looking for them. Um, in the pre-covery type of, of observations. 
So as I mentioned, JWSC, because it's more sensitive, uh, you can see further, it opens doors to studies that we haven't been able to do yet. It's a spectral uh, phenomenon, right, that we were looking at to, to understand some of the compositional information. Um, but JWSC also gives you your spatial images. So you can resolve the species, know where they are coming from uh, with respect to the comet and the coma, whether it's sunward, anti-sunward, et cetera. You can see some of the distribution, which gives us a little bit more information um, on maybe the shape of, of the comet, seasons on the comet, or the other small body, et cetera. And because it's in space and avoids telluric uh, absorption, it can detect all of the major things we know um, are compositional constituents on comets, water, CO2, and CO simultaneously, along with organics and some isotopes. So in the last few minutes here, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to jump from standard comets, as if you will, to main belt objects, main belt comet slash asteroids that also show activity and explain how they're slightly different from, from comets. Um, and this was a paper that was published last year by Mike Kelly from the University of Maryland, looking at comet uh, or asteroid 238P Reed, which was known to have cyclic activity. And even though the cyclic activity could be observed and looked at in the water lines, nobody was ever able to actually detect water just because the sensitivity wasn't there. So this activity was going on. There was clearly dust following um, you know, in this coma uh, around this particular asteroid slash main belt comet, um, but we didn't know what it was, what was producing it or, or what it was composed of, except for we could see the reflected dust. And so by turning JWST on it, it was actually, this is a um, just an infrared image of it, not showing any particular band, but when you broke down that reflected light with uh, what was was measured in the water uh, emission band, you can see there was a water coma as well. And you can see a very nice signal to noise detection of water right here in that particular spectrum. That's the bottom spectra in the middle plot here. Now, compared to a comet, Comet Hartley 2, because we always seem to go back to Comet Hartley 2, if you're from Maryland, being one of our targets of deep impact, you can see, okay, yep, CO2 was measured, I mean, sorry, water was measured in both this main belt comet and in Hartley too, but the organics are missing and the CO2 is missing. And so living in the asteroid belt for, um, for a very long period of time, probably almost the 400, I'm sorry, the 4 billion years, uh, four and a half billion years age of, of the solar system, if it had higher volatility um, molecules like CO2 and the carbon chain organics, those things have sublimation temperatures um, that are much colder than what you feel in the asteroid belt. And so these have all been depleted. They've been boiled off. The thermal wave would have propagated through um, these small main belt objects that aren't as large as things like, like Vesta and Ceres. And so water was detected in this main belt comet. It is active. It is cyclic, um, but it does not have any CO2. And, and that is, is one of the distinguishing things we think is between asteroids and, and comets. The asteroids can still retain a bit of water, uh, but they don't have any of the higher volatility um, species. Whether or not those species were ever there or whether it formed um, exactly in place where they are now um, and weren't put there as the larger planets migrated is, a, is an interesting question. And so right here is where that comet read, 238P read falls with respect to all the other comets that we have this measurement for, the CO2 to <clears throat> water ratio, because the CO2 is, is just an upper limit measurement. Um, so it's, it's more a main belt active asteroid than a comet. All right, now we jump to centaurs real quick. Centaur slash comet 39P Oterma was also uh, observed with James Webb um, last year. And this was the first detection of CO2 in a centaur. Again, centaurs are those transitional objects between the outer solar system and getting into a shorter period comet um, orbit under the influence of Jupiter's gravity. And not only did we measure CO2 for the first time in this type of object, but we also measured a, a nice ice band. Uh, the black is the uh, spectrum of 
39 Pia Terma. The blue is the spectrum of 67P Cherry Mascara Semenko, which was the target of Rosetta. And you see the, the black and the blue don't match very well. But again, coming back to Comet Hartley 2, this red line we overplot to show you. A terma does not have the same amount of water and CO2 emission lines as Hartley 2 does, but you can see the ice absorptions, which would be down here at two microns, and this ice absorption really large and nicely fit together here at three microns are similar. So it's quite possible that 39 pioterma, um, the CO2 that we've detected might also be spitting out a bunch of ice particles, small ice particles like we saw in Hartley 2. And I believe this is my final slide before I thank you. Yet another centaur, James Webb again, opening up um, a lot of things for us to look, things that are beyond what we normally look at and propose to look at with, with various telescopes. Uh, we looked at 29P schlossman bachmann one Again, we measured CO2. We also were able to measure CO in this particular, um, particular object. And not only the, um, the molecule CO and CO2, but also their isophotons with various uh, isotopes of carbon and oxygen were measured. That is how um, sensitive and spectrally resolved the James Webb telescope data are. So James Webb has really opened up a whole new realm of things for us to look at in, in cometary science and small body science. And we're gonna get to the bottom of a lot more things that are out there in the sense of where did we come from? Coming back to those original questions I showed on my first slide, where did we come from? what types of compositions and what type of isotopes and such were in all of the original material that formed the plants, formed the solar system, and potentially brought the organics, the ingredients for life, and um, the water to the earth. So in summary, um, I hope you learned a little bit more about small bodies with me tonight, but they're fragments left over from the planetary formation but they're not at all boring, right? They're not trash. They have a lot of information stored in them. They're extremely active. Their activity manifests in numerous ways, which I shared with you tonight. Um, and the next generation of all sky surveys and space telescopes allow for this activity to be readily spotted and enables quick follow-up studies, including compositional studies. Um, James Webb included is, uh, makes things that were not previously possible possible for our observations. Um, and then finally, the Planetary Decadal Survey, which happens every 10 years, hence the word decadal, um, for 2023 to 2032 came out and has comet surface sample return as a top priority mission in the NASA New Frontiers class. So that means the next time NASA um, has budgetary aligned for a New Frontiers class mission and an announcement for opportunity, um, people can uh, propose to have a comet surface sample return mission. Um, and bringing home a sample from a comet surface can get even more to the bottom of these various compositional, uh, both surface and subsurface compositions of these small bodies, how similar they are to each other um, and how what the ground truth is from what we see from the Earth or from Earth-based telescopes. Um, you know, what are we seeing and is that ground truth of what's actually on the surface and how we understand activity from our remote observations. So with that, I will thank you all. Um, let's start it here. Do we have questions? Yes, we have several. So you had your hand up first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, your spectra, you heard these emission and absorption lines. Is there a continuum as well? What causes a continuum? And that's the question. Okay, so the question for those online was when I showed various spectra, there were emission lines, which were the bumps up, right? And absorption lines, which are the dips. Um, and there was also a continuum. And what is the continuum caused by? Yes, there was a continuum in just about everything I showed. A lot of times when we're doing the um, integration to make the maps, the thing is to try to remove the continuum. Uh, but the continuum is from the reflected light off of the grains in the coma, whether they're icy grains or dust grains. Um, and that is on the short wavelength side in the infrared I'm talking about in the, um, in the short wavelength. In the longer wavelength infrared, it's a thermal background. So it's those same grains, but now they're reflecting thermally. And so it's re-emission um, in the thermal side. So yes, there is a continuum on these bodies that we're looking at in the coma and it's dust grains reflecting um, the reflected light of the thermal. The other thing I want to ask is the rotation of the 
Doesn't that influence when they're going to outburst and all that, depending on what part of the comet's actually facing the sun? Uh, how, is there any way you can account for rotation being measured? Yep. So, okay. So, the another question from the from the room is: Does rotation of one of these small bodies affect their um, their activity levels, whether they're outbursting or their asymmetries and that type of thing? And how do you measure that? Yes. If we have the telescope time and the geometry from whatever telescope we're looking at allows us, uh, we try to phase observations so that we get rotational coverage. Um, and if we get enough rotational coverage, we try to pinpoint the actual rotational period. Um, with the shape of the light curve, sometimes we can get an idea of potential shapes or pole positions. Um, the pole positions and shape are much or farther between than the rotational measurements and periods that we have. Um, but yes, we true we do try to get to the bottom of some of that and piece it together with the cyclic outbursting activity or you know where a, if it always shows uh, asymmetry in one direction, is it because it's an oblong shape and that's the, the half that's more active or seasonally facing the sun right now, that type of thing. Yes. Yes. Uh that uh, deuterium hydrogen fractionization is fascinating. What is the mechanism by which it, the fractionation occurred early on in the proto-solar nebula? That is a good question. We have a question asking about the fractionation of the deuterium and the hydrogen from the beginning, from the protoplanetary disk. I personally am still reading up on that and trying to understand it myself, um, but there is fractionation from the beginning and whatever was ingrained in some of these um, comets and small bodies has changed as it's been processed on the earth. So the question even is, is standard earth water a true measurement to be comparing these two, right? Is that really the earth's D to H ratio? Um, so yes, there is a process. I can't tell you all of the specifics because I am still learning it myself, but. I think we have questions on the line. <clears throat> was Rob watching them or was it? Was that, are you watching the question on the line? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's good. There's another one here. Yeah, just, I, I, or two more here. Yeah. No, no questions on the line. Um, for the fear of asking a dumb question, am I am I sensing that asteroids, as we commonly in the asteroid belt, the traditional asteroid, the comet, elementally, and what they're made of, are is that converging? Is it? Are they really part of the same family more than we knew before? Right. So that's a very good question. The question from the floor here was, is there actually more of a continuum or a convergence of what a comet and what an asteroid is based on their composition, their activity, and things that we're able to study now, if I paraphrase. Yes. Well, okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so we've always thought that comets were um, dirty snowballs, mm -hmm. and now we kind of more think of them as icy dirt balls because they have <laughs> less ice <laughs> on the surface. That, you know, they're not just this icy thing that comes in, right? There's some subsurface ice um, and they're definitely still retaining volatiles or we wouldn't be measuring N2, the nitrogen, the carbon monoxide and the highly volatile species. Um, but the fact that there is activity and there is water in the asteroid belt and lots of mixing in between of chondrules and, and various things that we see in the cometary um, samples and meteorite samples that we do have from the coma of belt two and, and from meteorites and the samples from the asteroid belt and the near um, the near earth asteroids like Bennu um, and the Hayabusa experiments from JAXA, we are seeing a lot of similar silicate materials in all both the, the asteroids and the comets. Okay. Um, the CAIs in both the asteroids and the comets. So they both have been very hot or there was a lot of mixing in the protoplanetary disk. 
The higher volatile species, though, we are still only seeing in the dynamical things that we call comets, right? Things that go beyond or spent part of their lifetime beyond the asteroid belt. So I agree with you that there is a continuum of these bodies. I agree that there is a whole lot of mixing. I don't think too many comets have been captured and are in the asteroid belt. So I don't understand anything tonight, but <laughs> <laughs> what I think I, or did I hear that, or is a comet a byproduct of asteroid activity? <laughs> No, a comet. So the question was, is a comet a byproduct of asteroid activity? No, a comet is not a byproduct of asteroid activity. Lots of these fragments of, of grains forming and ices condensing on them happen at the beginning of the solar system, and they've been dynamically perturbed throughout our solar system. And the things that are in the asteroid belt have just been much, much warmer and have lost most of their volatiles, and they're fairly dynamically stable. And the, the comets come and go at their leisure or the leisure of a passing by star or a gravitational lineup with Jupiter. Um, and so the comets are shedding much more material. When you see things with these long tails in the sky, those are comets, those are not asteroids. <laughs> we'll grab you and then you. Is there a way of measuring other element abundances in the comet? The, maybe the Nobel gases in that? The Nobel gases, okay. So the question was, is there a way to measure some of the noble gases, for example, in common. And yes, the answer is yes. Uh, mass spectrometer can do so. In fact, on Rosetta, we had a very functioning uh, mass spectrometer that measured, um, it measured nitrogen and it measured argon, I believe. We also, with stacked images in the ultraviolet, um, saw an absorption of argon. So, neon, neon, we did not detect, but argon, yeah, did, but yeah. argon we did. You can't detect that in the sun, it's no gas. It's so that's so, valuable. To, yeah. So, mass spectrometers in situ in a coma of a comet, yeah. it has been done. It They can get to some of the no gases. Question. Uh, sort of a two-part question. Mm -hmm. uh, did I correctly understand that the JWST will have more of a capacity to detect organics? And if so, which organics? Very good question. Yep. So the question was, will JWST have the ability to detect organics? If so, which organics? So yes, it is more sensitive. And so when something has a very low abundance, right, it's only 1% compared to water, or even a fraction of a percent compared to water. You have to have a fairly high sensitivity in order to see it, you know, come above your noise. Um, we have some very high spectral resolved telescopes here on Earth um, in Hawaii, like a 10 meter telescope at Kakro Gemini. And those eight to 10 meter telescopes can spectrally resolve something, but it still needs to be shifted enough in the emission from the Earth's atmosphere that you see some of these organics because they overlap with things in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so the, the geometry of the passing by object has to be at a speed that shifts it out of the Earth's telluric lines, um, and, and then you can see it spectrally, and it can be resolved spectrally. But the sensitivity of James Webb is so much higher than the ground-based observations, and you don't need to worry about getting out of the telluric line so even at these fractions of a percent, you should be able to measure these organics um, in addition to the, the water and the CO2 so you can get the relative abundance of these. Um, the types of organics, typically methanol, methane, ethane, HCN, which is not technically an organic, um, formaldehyde, all of those are in that three to four micron range, which is prime observing time for JWST. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and all of them have been detected in a comet at some level, most of them in a very bright, very big, very prolifically active comet like hale -Bopp. Um, But if you're just looking at the run of the mill comet and you're trying to get a population study of do all comets have this or is this a routine number of organics or you know, what's the potential that they actually brought it to the Earth? You want more than 
a study of one, right, or a measurement of one or two. And so James Webb opens that door because it can measure the much lower abundances in a much larger population. Um, what elements or combination of elements would you personally like consider most intriguing to uh, organic elements? Do you personally consider most intriguing to find on a body like a comet, asteroid, or even exoplanet? Okay, so the question in the room here was, personally, which uh, organic molecule or um species would i like to see or which you know would be an interesting discovery to see in these comets or extrasolar planets um phosphorus is a big one right so something with phosphor in it phosphorus um sulfides are really big right now um because there's a lot of unidentified lines in things that we saw um over these years of of spectroscopic uh, observations of, of comets and asteroids. And Rosetta saw a lot of sulfur in, in um, that comet. Um, so, but I would say phosphorus. What <coughs> wavelength is this? For, for which one? Sulfur. For sulfur. sulfur. So sulfur is often in the um, near ultraviolet, far ultraviolet. So, 320 nanometers or so. Um, CS is in the radio. I mean, it, it spans the, the gamut. I believe CS lines are measured in the radio. So any other, other questions? Neutral, neutral sulfur. It's a lot of Neutral sulfur is actually, some of that is in the visible. Yeah. yeah. It's not, but there's no ionized. There's not much ionized stuff. Is there? Yeah. Or <laughs> not positive. Yeah. Was there any other questions? We're losing. I mean, we're past our time and losing people. I've got accolades from the online. All right. people. Yes, yeah, very you. much so. Thank you very much for the interview.